Praise God. Amen. Open your Bibles tonight to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19. Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 19. <clears throat> if you never fight, you'll never win. Amen. And they shall fight against thee, but they shall not prevail against thee. For I am with thee, saith the Lord, to deliver thee. You may be seated. They shall fight against you, whatever your adversary is. We know it's the devil in a spiritual sense. He's going to fight against you. But he will not overcome you, for the Lord is with you to deliver you. The Lord sends us into situations that we cannot control. So we'll trust him that he's in control. Amen? Amen? Cowardice is contagious. Cowardice is contagious. You notice if one bails out, it's easier for another to bail out. But also, on the opposite end, courage is contagious. Paul's courage inspired others to live for God. If you can go to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 14, Philippians chapter 1 and verse 14, and then Hebrews 10, 32 after that. Philippians chapter 1 and verse 14. The Bible says, And many of the brethren in the Lord, waxing confident in my bonds, are much more bold to speak the word without fear. Paul said, Because I'm in this prison, because I spoke the word without fear, now others are speaking the word without fear because courage is contagious. Testimony service is good as long as it's based on courage. But sometimes we're afraid to have testimony service because it becomes something besides testimony. Somebody say pray. Thank you, thank you, Pastor Croft back there. It's like, well, can't we have testimony like we used to? Uh, well, maybe. If we get up and talk about how great God is and how we're working with the Lord, and but if we're going to whine and complain and moan and groan, that won't inspire the presence of God. But courage can inspire people. And Paul said, I'm in this prison, but I, I'm thankful because of my courage to stand. Even though I'm in these bonds, it has encouraged others to stand. Hebrews 10, Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32 begins. <clears throat> But I call to remembrance the former days in which after ye were illuminated, ye endured a great flight of affliction. Verse 30, go ahead, keep on going down through verse 36. Partly whilst ye were made gain stock, both by reproaches and afflictions, and partly whilst ye became companions of them that were so used. Verse 34, for ye had compassion of me and my bonds and took joyfully the spalling of your goods. He said, because... I was in prison. You didn't think an old bad thing that you lost some stuff. Knowing in yourselves that you have in heaven a better and enduring substance, cast not away, therefore, your confidence. He said, don't let go of your confidence. You had it when you started. Hang on to that confidence, which hath great recompense of reward. Verse 36, for you have need of patience that after you have done the will of God, you might receive the promise. He said, hang on. Don't give up. Stay in the race. Now, courage is contagious. And when we are courageous in difficult times, it causes others to be courageous in difficult times. When a brave man takes a stand, the spines of others are often stiffened to stand up too. In the summer of 480 B.C., a great battle between the Greeks and the Persians took place. The Persians mounted an imposing army of 80,000, some say 100,000 soldiers in that Persian army under Xerxes. 
under the command of, of that great leader, Xerxes. And they were very well equipped, and they were the world power at the time. And they were going to sweep in to Greece and take over that part of the world. And Persia was vastly superior in regards to men and resources. They were going to crush the Greeks and take their land. Now, Xerxes is also the same person called Ahasuerus in the book of Esther. Because of translation, it translates over to Ahasuerus, but it's Xerxes the Great, and he came after Darius, who was in the book of Daniel, and he ruled from 486 B.C. to 465 B.C. And when he was assassinated, he was assassinated by his own commander of the royal bodyguard. That's why it's not good to be in government sometimes. But he was a great leader for a time. But he was well equipped and his goal was to take more land. And so he's sweeping in to crush the Greeks and take their land. When the news reached Greece of the impending invasion, they mustered everyone they could. 4,000 troops, some say. Some say 7,000 troops. Either number you want to pick, it's a whole lot less than what the Persians were coming down with. They were badly outnumbered. At the heart of their army were 300 Spartan warriors under the command of their king, Leonidas, whose name meant son of a lion or like a lion. The Spartan warriors had two choices in battle, return home a victor or die in the fight. That was what they lived by. We will fight and we will win, or we will fight and we will die. That's the call of Christianity. Never look back. They preferred death to surrender. They preferred to lose their life than to become a captive to their enemy. They chose to go out and meet the massive Persian army that was coming down upon them. 80,000 or 100,000 strong coming their way. And they chose to meet them at a narrow mountain pass called Thermopylae. You've probably heard of it. It was a narrow pass. There's water on one side, a mountain on the other, and it's not very wide. And there they had a small army, and they would try to meet that army at a narrow bottleneck, so hopefully to somewhat even out the battle so the enemy could not come around them and flank them on both sides. They would fight toe to toe. And while Xerxes arrived, when he arrived and saw the small force of Greek soldiers in position, he believed the army would surrender. So he just waited for several days before attacking, thinking they're going to look at us, they're going to realize how big we are, and they're going to come to their senses, and they're going to surrender. Finally, Xerxes sent an envoy with a message for the Greeks to hand over their company's weapons and to submit to Xerxes and his army. This was their chance to live. The story goes that Leonidas, the leader, sent a message back to Xerxes that says this, Molan Leib. Everybody say Molan Leib. That simply means this, come and take them. We ain't laying nothing down. Come and get them. Come on, Devin. Devil and get them. We ain't laying nothing down. I'm not laying holiness down. I'm not laying the oneness of God down. I'm not laying truth down. The devil can come on and get them if he wants to try to take them. But I started this with a mindset to win, and I'm going to fight to the end. Come on and take them is what they said. Surrender, even with certain death, was not an option for the Spartan soldiers. Handing over their weapons without a fight was inconceivable to them. Matter of fact, if you read the books that Paul wrote, you'd think you better straighten up straight or Paul kick you out. You read the book of John, you think you can get away just about anything. You read the books of Paul, you think, Paul said, man, they ain't got no guts, let them go. He was rough. Paul was rough in some places. He turned folks over to the devil. He did all kinds of stuff. Because Paul had this mindset, I got into this thing to win. I'm, he, said, don't, they, he said, don't weep for me. I'm ready to give my life for this. To play. He said, I got in this to win. And if I go to jail, 
myself a breach take my life, so be it. Don't weep for me. I started it. I'm going to finish what I have begun. He said, we're not of those that turn back in Hebrews 10 unto perdition. We're those that stay the path unto the saving of the soul. And these Spartans wouldn't hand over their weapons. That was inconceivable to them to surrender. Leonidas, their leader, knew what this meant. That Thermopylae would be the place of their death. But they were still willing to fight to the death. They held the pass, the Thermopylae pass, for several days, history tells us, as the Persian force sent wave after wave of troops, but those Spartan warriors, those Greek warriors, knew how to line up a certain way, and I think it's called the phalanx or something like that, and they knew how to line up, and they knew they were skilled in the art of war. And they knew how to fight toe to toe and shoulder to shoulder and fight one for another and they stayed together. Oh, God help us. They stayed together. Woo! If the devil wants to do anything, he wants to get you away from the body of Christ. But they stayed together and wave after wave of attack. They repelled day after day. Maybe 70, highest number 70,000 men versus lowest number 80,000. I'm a 7,000 men. Highest number of Greeks, 80,000 men. Lowest number of Persians. Wave after wave. And they held their lines and they held their rank and they pushed them back every time. Until a Lokan man named Epitaz. Epitaz is how I say his name. I may have said it wrong, but a local man showed these Persians, these invaders, he showed them a secret passage through the mountains whereby they could come around behind the Greeks and outflank them. The passage was only wide enough for a carriage to get through, but once Leonidas, the Spartan leader, realized they were outflanked, when he realized that had happened, he sent many of the Greek soldiers home. He sent them home. Out of the 7,000 men, he sent back most of the army. And he proposed he and his men would stay and fight to the death. Give them time to go back and regroup. We'll hold this spot as long as we can. It was his last stand. He knew it was his last stand. He and the infamous 300 fighters Spartans valiantly fought to their death. Though they lost the battle, the news of their great sacrifice traveled across the Greek countryside. The courage of the Spartans was contagious. Greece ultimately held their ground, and Xerxes, along with his troops, finally did withdraw back to Persia, and they never conquered Greece because they lost at Thermopylae. Their victory was their defeat. The devil lost at Calvary. Right. Right. He thought he won, but he lost. All right. All right. The courage of the Spartans was contagious and it spread around to the other Greeks that said, wait, wait a minute, if they're going to stand and fight, we ought to stand up and fight. We ought not lay down. We ought to fight the good fight. Today, a monument stands at the site of the great battle as a reminder of the, cur of the courage of these 300 men. Can you go to Hebrews 11 for me? Hebrews 11, verse 31 is where I'll begin. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 31. I'll be reading through chapter 12 of verse 3. Quite a few verses here. By faith, the heart at rehab perished not with them that believed not when she had received the spies with peace. What shall I more say, Paul said, for the time would fail me to tell of Gideon and of Barak and of Samson and of Jephthah, also of David and of Samuel and of the prophets, who through faith subdued kingdoms, wrought righteousness, obtained promises, stopped the mouths of lions. 
quenched the violence of fire, escaped the edge of the sword, out of weakness were made strong, waxed valiant in fight, turned to flight the armies of the aliens. Women received their dead raised to life again, and others were tortured, not accepting, not accepting deliverance. Unbelievable, not accepting deliverance, that they might obtain a better resurrection. And others had trial of cruel mockings and scourgings, yea, moreover, of bonds and imprisonment. They were stoned, they were sawn asunder, were tempted, were slain, slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, and tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and in mountains and dens and in caves of the earth. All these, having obtained a good report through faith, received not the promise. God, having provided some better thing for us, that without us should not be made, they should not be made perfect. Go ahead. 12 and verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses. What witnesses? The ones I just read to you. God help us. If we lay down our weapons and quit, when they went through all that and didn't even have the Holy Ghost. Wherefore, seeing we are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, there's the key. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Quit worrying about what Brother Gardner's doing or what Sister so and sos doing or what somebody else is doing. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross, despising the shame and is set down at the right hand of God. Verse 3, final verse. For consider Him that endured such contradiction of sinners against Himself lest you be wearied and faint in your minds. This Christian walk ain't a walk of roses. It's a battle. It's a fight. you got to be able to give everything to stay in the fight. This is our monument. Today that monument stands at Thermopylae of 300 Spartans. It said we will give everything for our country. But this is our monument where we give everything. Why would they face the greatest army of all time and refuse to surrender even after the invading king offered them life? This is why Greece was their kingdom. The women and children they protected were their families. Being subject to a foreign kingdom was not an option to them. Shrinking back before the enemy of our souls is not an option for us. Understand, if you stay in the race, it's going to cost you something. But I want you to understand, if you get out of the race, it's going to cost you something. You're going to pay one way or the other. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. Hope I don't hurt nobody's feelings. I ain't trying to cuss, but come hell or high water. Church grow, church shrink. People do right, people do wrong. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on the promises of God. Because it's going to cost me, Brother A. If I back up, it's going to cost me more than I really want to pay. Because it's not going to just affect me. There's three little kids back here it's going to affect. God have mercy. I wish I could preach to ever. I wish somehow God would get a hold of us. When I see people leave this precious truth. And they have children. It breaks my heart. Because I, I think they didn't hurt me. It hurts me. But they didn't hurt me. They just hurt some kids. 
That may not preach good and it may not be pretty, but you better hear this preacher. That's the truth. For my Bible says and your Bible says it would have been better to have never known the way of truth. There's no option of turning back. There's no option of surrender. There's no option of dropping anything. We've got to keep on keeping on. Can't shrink back before the enemy. He may look bigger than us and better than us, and he may have the, the, the larger army in our sight, and his temptations may be alluring, but we better keep the fight a going. We better have in our mind Monet, Molan, Lebe. You want these weapons, devil, you come and get them. You want this house, you're going to have to come through me. You want this church, you're going to have to come through me. We're ready to fight. So I leave you with this. Remember, if you keep on, it's going to cost you. And if you quit, it's going to cost you. Fight the good fight of faith, whatever the cost. And when God is your God and your faith becomes your faith, courage will come. When it's no longer about pastor's church or pastor's faith or pastor's walk, but now it's my God, my faith. I'm going to fight for it. We must remember our Lord cannot and will not fail because He won ultimately at Calvary. We've just got to fight the good fight of faith, whether by life or by death. Paul said to live as Christ, to die is gain. In other words, flip the coin, heads or tails, we win. If we stay in the fight, Paul said, I have fought a good fight. I have finished my course. I have kept the faith, but it was a fight. And let me tell you who your greatest adversary is. You. Another battle took place thousands of years earlier where our eternal souls were on the line, when Adam, the first Adam, betrayed his Creator, and he ran in shame. And I'm of the opinion, just my opinion, that when God said, where are you? He was trying to get Adam to repent. Because God knew where Adam was. But God was not willing to let us be lost. So he came, robed himself in, fl in flesh, shed holy blood that was needed to ransom us. He bought humanity's freedom, and it cost him a great price. And we read in Hebrews, look at the price he paid before you become weary and faint in your mind. The next verse, and I didn't read it, it's Hebrews uh, that chapter 12, verse 4. It says, you have not fought unto blood resisting sin. Understand, Jesus shed his life. Look to him for the example, but who could faithfully shed the blood that was required? Only one. The spotless, sinless Lamb of God was the only one that could redeem us. That's why God had to come. The sinless Lion of the tribe of Judah. The Lion had returned to this world as the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. He shed His blood. He paid the debt. The ransom was made. Redemption was done. And the game was over. But the problem is the enemy still fighting and still warring. So we've still got to fight the good fight of faith. We can look to Him for all the courage we need to face the lions in our life. And there's going to be lions. Honey, when you get into this, get ready for a fight. But understand, the lion of the tribe of Judah lives within us. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Now the way we fight looks a little different than the way they fought at Thermopylae. At Thermopylae, they fought to their death. We fight like the Lamb of God fights. By laying down our lives. For him. 
by losing our lives to gain his life. Daniel chapter 11, verse 32. Daniel eleven thirty two, I'll be reading through thirty five. Daniel knew his God quite well. And such as do wickedly against the covenant shall he corrupt with flatteries. But the people that do know their God shall be strong and do exploits. Keep going. And they that understand among the people shall instruct many, yet they shall fall by the sword and by flame, and by captivity, and by spoil many days. Notice, they give up their life, but they don't quit. Verse 34, Now when they shall fall, they shall be holding, holding up with a little help. In other words, what that saying actually is, there ain't much help coming for them. It don't appear. But many shall cleave unto them with flatteries. In other words, there's going to be a whole lot of people who's cleaving to them ain't really trying to help them at all. Verse 35, and some of them of understanding shall fall to try them, to purge, and to make them white, even to the time of the end, because it is yet for a time upon, verse 36. That's good. We'll stop right there. Daniel knew his God. and The Bible says, they that know their God shall be strong and do exploits. And it's going to be a time of great tribulation and great horrible things happening to these people who know their God. Daniel chose to stand his ground in the face of the lion's den, in the face of the lion's culture in Babylon in which he lived. Daniel didn't back down from his faith, even in the face of certain death. Surrender to Daniel was not an option. Why? I believe it was because he knew his God. God was his God. Now, in the Bible, the devil is compared to a roaring lion who seeketh whom he may devour. And we face lions for different reasons. Some penetrate our defenses because of our own folly, while others attack as part of the normal spiritual state of affairs of this world, their spiritual wickedness in high places. There's demonic forces at work in this world world. Satan is called the prince and power of the air in this dimension. And so there's going to be normal attacks against us in the spiritual sense. But sometimes the devil gets in just because we don't close the back door. I've prayed for people before, turned around and said, now listen, whatever I prayed about, go home and close that door. A few weeks later, guess who's back for prayer? Go home and close. God's not going to close the door for you. I can bathe you in oil, but you've got to close some doors where those spirits are coming in. Because there's a lion out there. Daniel wasn't the only man in the Bible to face lions, however. If you read the Scripture, you'll find Samson in Judges 14. He faced a lion. Now, Samson faced a lion for the wrong reasons, however. He faced a lion because he was on his way. He was on a path for a relationship with a Philistine foreign woman, which was against the law of Moses. He was on a path on his way to do something that was against the will of God. And the Bible says his mom and dad tried to talk him out of it, but he said, I'm going to do what I'm going to do. I don't care what you say. He was on a path of rebellion. And on that path of rebellion, he found a lion. On the way to that Philistine girl's house, a lion attacked him. One lion he most likely would have never met had he not been going in that direction, on that road, that day. You're going to meet some lines. Make sure you don't meet them in a state of rebellion. Because when you get outside of God's boundaries, you're still going to meet lines. I want you to know this. Samson killed that line. Now it appears that, I mean the Bible says the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he ripped the line apart. And it appears, wow, 
He's walking in rebellion and he just had a victory, but he had a great defeat because he was deceived. He thought, well, if I can feel the presence of God and I can still have little victories and I can rebel against authority of God and authority of parents and I can still feel God, everything, but he was deceived. Because just a few days later in his rebellious state, he walked by and he found some honey inside the carcass of that lion. And he wasn't to touch a dead body. That was against his Nazarite vow. But he was in a state of rebellion. Let me tell you something. Even a dead lion can get you if you ain't walking right with God. Samson was defeated by a dead lion. He never should have met the lion. But when he got outside the boundaries of God, the lion was there. There was another guy who met a lion, the prophet. It's in 1 Kings 13, unnamed prophet. He met a young prophet on the road. God sent the young prophet to deliver a word of rebuke to Israel's idolatrous king. But God also instructed that young prophet to remain in Israel. Not to remain in Israel, excuse me. But to return to Judah without eating or drinking with anyone. In other words, make haste, get back. Don't stop and chat with nobody. Tell the king what I said and go straight home. An older prophet invited the young prophet in for a meal. Claiming that God instructed him to do so. But he was lying. And that young prophet disobeyed God's original command. And as he returned home after eating with the older prophet, he met a lion on the road. And the Bible says the lion ripped him apart and killed him on the way home. Once again, he was in a spirit of rebellion. You're going to meet some lions. Make sure you don't meet them in a spirit of rebellion. We find another young man in the Bible who met a lion. His name was David. Before he confronted Goliath, David also faced a lion. The beast showed up to devour one of his sheep. But David took that lion out. The attack came as David faithfully fulfilled his calling. His calling at that time was simply to take care of the sheep. He was doing what his father had told him to do. And he met a lion. See, if you're doing the wrong thing, you're going to meet a lion. And if you're doing the right thing, you're going to meet a lion. David was faithful in the little things, serving God with diligence where God had placed him. And when you're doing that, you're going to meet some lions. But if you're doing the will of God, you'll have the strength to overcome those lions. But let me tell you, if you're not doing the will of God, you're in trouble when that line meets you. Benaiah was another man in the Bible. He was one of David's mighty men. The Bible speaks of one time when he went down into a pit. In 2 Samuel 23, he went down into a pit, the Bible says, on a snowy day and killed a lion. And in my mind, what I'm thinking happened and studying it out is probably like one of those little communities over in Africa or somewhere where a lion will move in beside the village and find easy prey of people. Find that it's a whole lot easier to pick off a little child or pick off a, a lady who's out trying to get some water. It's a lot easier meal than chasing down a gazelle or something of that kind. And so a lion, when they realize it, will move in and somebody's got to stand up and go get the lion. And I think that's what Benaiah did. They had a lion that come in on a snowy day. There wasn't no easy meal, and he come close to the village. And so David's man, Benaiah, he went out and he attacked and he killed the lion. He went down and killed the lion before the lion could harm anyone in the village. And so it is with the house of God. He's given us apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers and evangelists that can help protect us from the lions. Lion, lions hunt along paths of obedience, and they hunt along paths of 
disobedience. And you're going to meet a lion. When we walk the path of obedience, however, God gives us the strength to overcome the lion we're going to meet. Daniel in the lion's den. There he was with the lions prowling all around him, looking as if they will devour him at any moment in time. Probably at his feet were the bones of those who had been thrown in there before Daniel ever arrived, scattered on the ground. But even in the lion's den, Daniel kept his customs and stood by faith and not fear. He focused on the lion of the tribe of Judah, who is on the throne. He trusted his God to take care of him, and he didn't surrender. When he had the chance to back out, he said, no, I'm going to stay with it. I'm not going to give up. We live in a day of lions. And the Bible says it's getting worse and worse. Deceiving and being deceived, it's getting worse and worse all the time. And it's getting a whole lot easier to get away from the safe place. Matter of fact, the Bible prophesies it. It says, as you see the day approaching, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together. So much the more, he said. In other words, this is going to be a whole lot more important when you see the day of the Lord coming. Why? Because there's more lions now than there ever has been. There's more twisted up doctrines out there now than there ever has been. There's more easy believism now than there ever has been. There's more lions on the attack. Why? Because the Bible says Satan knows he has but a short time. And his wrath is going to be revealed before the Lord comes back in a great and powerful way. So the church better get ready to stand against the lions. Better get close to God before the storm hits. I always wonder about those that say, I'll live for God through whatever, but they won't come to church. I told Sister Meeks tonight, I shook her hand. I said, Sister Meeks, I appreciate you. I said, because when you come to church, you come in pain. And you know, Sister Meeks, it, her, her age and her status, she might could find a way out of it. Not might, she could. But she comes. Because this is the safe place. This is the safe place. And there's a storm out there, and it's going to get worse. The Bible speaks of persecution. And we've got to get some courage in us that says, no matter what it takes, I'm going to make it. It is boldness in us that opens the doors to the miraculous that God wants to do. It is when we see the hardships, but we buckle up and we become bold in faith. That's where God operates the best. Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 10. Ephesians chapter 6, beginning in verse 10 through verse 11. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. But before you put that armor on, get your strength in the Lord. Start believing the Lord's going to come through. The Lord's going to make a way. Be strong in the Lord. Because we're going to hit some days, probably in this country before long, that we're going to look back and say, how did we get here? Now, this is going to be real straight and real strong, but it's going to be real true. I can tell you how we got here. People left God. People say, why did God leave us? He didn't leave us. We left him. Somebody think I think it was Billy Graham's daughter. Somebody asked her one time, 
Why are all these shootings? Why did God let all these massacres in these schools and all these things? Where's God? And she replied, y'all kicked him out years ago. Let me tell you, if you ask God to leave, he will. The reason we're in trouble as a nation is because, oh, I'm just going to be real honest, and y'all can vote me out tomorrow, but let me just get real honest. The reason we're in trouble, not us individually, I'm just talking about as a nation, the reason we're in trouble is because people, the devil came in with entertainment, and it went from one channel with static to 100 channels, and you couldn't find nothing to watch. So now you got 300 channels and people said you know what I think I'll stay home from church here's the sad thing when you stay home from church that teaches the kids that Jesus is not important Don't come back years later and say, Pastor, do something with them. I'm going to say, you already done it with them. They're not going to believe what I'm preaching because you didn't bring them to hear it. I'm not pointing the finger at us. I'm just talking in generalities. That's why we are where we are. When people started putting the things of God down, in their mind, they thought, ah, it's not a big deal. Oh, it's a big, big deal. Me and my wife were talking about it earlier. There's people who slowly are backsliding out. Slowly, slowly backsliding out. And they don't see the handwriting on the wall. And if I was to say anything to them, they'd just get mad and leave quicker. So I just be quiet. Because here's the truth. I'm not their pastor anyway have a church they just don't have a pastor but that's why our nation's in trouble is because people got away from the things of God and so now those who are going to stand are going to have to get a backbone like a saw log that says I will not bend I will not break I'm going to stand for the things of God I never shall forget the day. I got the, it was a revelation to me, but I, I, I preached it here. That when Ruth left the house of bread, she left the house of bread because there was a famine. And she thought, I'll go over to the enemy's camp. I heard they got bread over there. And we're starving to death over here. Ruth went to the enemy's camp. She lost her husband. And her two kids. Now here's the, here's the truth. Ruth made it back. But she said, don't you ever call me blessed again. When I left, I was blessed. Yeah, I got back, but I'll never be called blessed. Why, Ruth? Why can't you be called blessed? Because I lost my kids. And I lost my husband. Don't leave the house of bread. It costs her. And I think that's why we're, that's not even this lesson, but I think that's what, why we're in such a mess is because God has become just the Savior, not the Lord. But when He's Savior, they just want Him to get them out of hell. Just, just heal me today, God, and I'll go on my way. Or break this chain for me, or stop this devil for me, and I'll go on my way. And he's just a Savior, but he wants to be Lord. So we've got to get a backbone like a saw log, like Leonidas and his 300 Spartans. We must stand in the gap at our own Thermopylae to protect against the coming onslaught of hell. And I'm not prophesying, but I'm telling you, it's coming. There's grave days ahead, even for this country. I believe we've got some serious problems coming because we've killed a lot of babies. 
we've broke a lot of things. Sin does not exalt a nation. Righteousness exalts a nation. All that to kind of understand, we got to bow up and do what's right. We'll still come through for those who will stand. You look in the book of Daniel, and you find Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. You, you find basically four Hebrew boys. Where's the rest of them? It's easy. Because the good news is this God still reigns. Our God can still feed us. When we, our God could still, still, protect, still protect us in a den of lions. But here's the case Dan go in there. God, you're saying, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith. I may lose some friends. I may lose some acquaintances, but I've made up my mind. I'm going to fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. And this is not in either, but let me share this with you. And here's the other good news. See, God loves people that are faithful. Abraham was known as a man of faith. And it's because of his faithfulness, I believe, that Abraham could pray for Lot. And it's because of Abraham's faithfulness that God even stopped by. I hope and pray walk with God that if the devil one day up with Abby or with Sky that God just swings by my place tell you about something get if you live sporadically and here, there, and yonder, and God ain't the priority, you're not going to get that. Abraham's prayer was heard and heeded because he walked. You got to have a made up mind. Let's stand.